Vincent Easton was waiting under the clock at Victoria Station. Now and then he glanced up at it uneasily. How many other men have waited here for a woman and didn't come? Supposing Leo doesn't come? Supposing she's changed her mind? Women do that sort of thing. How sure am I of her? Do I really know anything about her? She had puzzled him from the first. There had seemed to be two women. The lovely, laughing creature, who was Richard Darrell's wife, and the other, silent, mysterious, who had walked by his side in the garden at Hamer's Close. Like a magnolia flower. That was how he thought of her. Perhaps because it was under the magnolia tree that they had tasted their first rapturous, incredulous kiss. The air had been sweet with the scent of magnolia blossom, and one or two petals, velvetly soft and fragrant, had floated down, resting on that upturned face that was as creamy and as soft and as silent as they. Magnolia blossom. Exotic, fragrant, mysterious. That had been a fortnight ago, the second day he had met her. And now he was waiting for her to come to him forever. Again incredulity shot through him. She wouldn't come. How could he ever have believed it? It would be giving up so much. The beautiful Mrs. Darrell couldn't do that sort of thing quietly. It was bound to be a nine days wonder, a far-reaching scandal that would never quite be forgotten. There were better, more expedient ways of doing these things. A discreet divorce, for instance. But they had not thought of that for a moment. At least he had not. Had she, he wondered. He had never known anything of her thoughts. He had asked her to come away with him almost timorously, for after all, what was he, nobody in particular, one of a thousand orange growers in the Transvaal? What a life to take her to, after the brilliance of London! And yet, since he wanted her so desperately, he must needs ask. She had consented, very quietly, with no hesitations or protests, as though it were the simplest thing in the world that he was asking her. Tomorrow? he had asked, amazed, almost unbelieving, and she had promised in that soft, broken voice that was so different from the laughing brilliance of her social manner. He had compared her to a diamond when he first saw her, a thing of flashing fire reflecting light from a hundred facets, but at that first touch, that first kiss, she had changed miraculously to the clouded softness of a pearl, a pearl like a magnolia blossom, creamy pink. She had promised, and now he was waiting for her to fulfil that promise. He looked again at the clock. If she did not come soon, they would miss the train. Sharply a wave of reaction set in. She wouldn't come, of course she wouldn't come, fool that he'd be never to expect it. What were promises? He'd find a letter when he got back to his rooms, explaining, protesting, saying all the things that women do when they are excusing themselves for lack of courage. He felt anger, anger, and the bitterness of frustration. Then he saw her coming towards him down the platform, a faint smile on her face. She walked slowly, without haste or fluster, as one who had all eternity before her. She was in black, soft black that clung, with a little black hat that framed the wonderful creamy pallor of her face. So you've come, you've come, after all. Of course. How calm her voice sounded. How calm. I thought you wouldn't. Why? He didn't answer. Instead, he turned aside and requisitioned a passing porter. They had not much time. The next few minutes were all bustle and confusion. Then they were sitting in their reserved compartment and the drab houses of southern London were drifting by them. Theodora Darrell, sitting opposite him. At last she was his. And he knew now how incredulous up to that very last minute he had been. He had not dared to let himself believe. That magical, elusive quality about her had frightened him. It had seemed impossible that she would ever belong to him. Now that the suspense was over, the irrevocable step taken, he looked across at her. She lay back in the corner quite still. A faint smile lingered on her lips. Her eyes were cast down. The long black lashes swept the creamy curve of her cheek. What's in her mind now? What is she thinking of? Me? Her husband? 
What does she think about him anyway? Did she care for him once? Or did she never care? Does she hate him? Or is she indifferent to him? And with a pang, the thought swept through him. I don't know. I shall never know. I love her and I don't know anything about her. What she thinks or what she feels. His mind circled round the thought of Theodora Darrow's husband. He'd known plenty of married women who were only too ready to talk about their husbands, of how they were misunderstood by them, or how their finer feelings were ignored. Vincent Easton reflected cynically that it was one of the best-known opening gambits. But except casually, Theo had never spoken of Richard Darrell. Easton knew of him what everybody knew. He was a popular man, handsome, with an engaging, carefree manner. Everybody liked Darrell. His wife always seemed on excellent terms with him, but that proved nothing, Vincent reflected. Theo was well-bred. She would not air her grievances in public. And between them no word had passed. From that second evening of their meeting, when they had walked together in the garden, silent, their shoulders touching, and he had felt the faint tremor that shook her at his touch, there had been no explainings, no defining of the position. She had returned his kisses, a dumb, trembling creature, shorn of all that hard brilliance which, together with her cream and rose beauty, had made her famous. Never once had she spoken of her husband. Vincent had been thankful for it at the time. He had been glad to be spared the arguments of a woman who wished to assure herself and her lover that they were justified in yielding to their love. Now the tacit conspiracy of silence worried him. He had again that panic-stricken sense of knowing nothing about this strange creature who was willingly linking her life to his. He was afraid. In the impulse to reassure himself, he bent forward and laid a hand on the black-clad knee opposite him. He felt once again the faint tremor that shook her, and he reached up for her hand. Bending forward, he kissed the palm, a long, lingering kiss. He felt the response of her fingers on his, and, looking up, met her eyes and was content. He leaned back in his seat. For the moment he wanted no more. They were together, she was his, and presently he said in a light, almost bantering tone, You're very silent. Am I? Yes. You're sure you don't regret? Oh, no. He did not doubt the reply. There was an assurance of sincerity behind it. What are you thinking about? I want to know. I think I'm afraid. Afraid? Of happiness. He moved over beside her then, held her to him and kissed the softness of her face and neck. I love you. I love you. I love you. Her answer was in the clinging of her body, the abandon of her lips. Then he moved back to his own corner. He picked up a magazine, and so did she. Every now and then, over the top of the magazines, their eyes met, and they smiled. They arrived at Dover just after five. They were to spend the night there, and cross to the continent on the following day. Theo entered their sitting room in the hotel, with Vincent close behind her. He had a couple of evening papers in his hand, which he threw down on the table. Two of the hotel servants brought in the luggage and withdrew. Theo turned from the window where she had been standing looking out. In another minute they were in each other's arms. There was a discreet tap on the door, and they drew apart again. Damn it all, it doesn't seem as though we're ever going to be alone. It doesn't look like it. Sitting down on the sofa, she picked up one of the papers. The knock proved to be a waiter bearing tea. He laid it on the table, drawing the latter up to the sofa on which Theo was sitting, cast a deft glance around, inquired if there was anything further, and withdrew. Vincent, who had gone into the adjoining room, came back into the sitting room. Now for tea! Anything wrong? Theo was sitting bolt upright on the sofa. She was staring in front of her with dazed eyes, and her face had gone deathly white. What is it, sweetheart? For answer, she held out the paper to him, her finger pointing to the headline. Failure of Hobson, Jekyll and Lucas. The name of a big city firm conveyed nothing to him at the moment, though he had an irritating conviction in the back of his mind that it ought to do so. 
He looked inquiringly at Theo. Richard is Hobson, Jekyll and Lucas. Your husband? Yes. Vincent returned the paper and read the bald information it conveyed carefully. Phrases such as sudden crash, serious revelations to follow, other houses affected, struck him disagreeably. Roused by a movement, he looked up. Theo was adjusting her little black hat in front of a mirror. She turned at the movement he made, and her eyes looked steadily into his. Vincent, I must go to Richard. Don't be absurd! I must go to Richard. But my dear! She made a gesture towards the paper on the floor. It means ruin. Bankruptcy. I can't choose this day of all others to leave him. You have left him before you heard this. Be reasonable. You don't understand. I must go, Richard. And from that he could not move her. Strange that a creature so soft, so pliant, could be so unyielding. After the first, she did not argue. She let him say what he had to say unhindered. He held her in his arms, seeking to break her will by enslaving her senses. But though her soft mouth returned his kisses, he felt in her something aloof and invincible that withstood all his pleadings. He let her go at last, sick and weary of a vain endeavour. From pleading he had turned to bitterness, reproaching her with never having loved him. That too she took in silence, without protest, her face dumb and pitiful, giving the lie to his words. Rage mastered him in the end, and he hurled at her every cruel word he could think of, seeking only to bruise and batter her to her knees. At last the words gave out. There was nothing more to say. He sat, his head in his hands, staring down at the red pile carpet. By the door Theodora stood, a black shadow with a white face. It was all over. Goodbye, Vincent. He did not answer. The door opened and shut again. The Darrells lived in a house in Chelsea, an intriguing old world house, standing in a little garden of its own. Up the front of the house grew a magnolia tree, smutty, dirty, begrimed, but still a magnolia. Theo looked up at it as she stood on the doorstep some three hours later. A sudden smile twisted her mouth in pain. She went straight to the study at the back of the house. A man was pacing up and down in the room, a young man with a handsome face and a haggard expression. He gave an ejaculation of relief as she came in. Oh, thank God you've turned up, Theo. They said you'd taken your luggage with you and gone out of town somewhere. I heard the news and came back. Richard Darrell put an arm about her and drew her to the couch. They sat down upon it side by side. Theo drew herself free of the encircling arm in what seemed a perfectly natural manner. How bad is it, Richard? Just as bad as it can be, and that's saying a lot. Tell me. He began to walk up and down as he talked, and Theo sat and watched him. He was not to know that every now and then the room went dim and his voice faded from her hearing, while another room in a hotel at Dover came clearly before her eyes. Nevertheless, she managed to listen intelligently enough, and he came back and sat down on the couch by her. Fortunately, they can't touch our marriage settlement, and the house is yours also. Well, we'll have that at any rate. Then things will not be too bad. It means a fresh start, that's all. Quite so, yes. His voice did not ring true. Theo thought suddenly, there's something else. He hasn't told me everything. There's nothing more, Richard. Nothing worse. Worse? What should there be? I don't know. It'll be all right. Of course it'll be all right. Oh, I'm glad you're here. It'll be all right now that you're here. Whatever else happens, I've got you, haven't I? Yes, you've got me. This time she left his arm around her. He kissed her and held her close to him as though in some strange way he derived comfort from her nearness. I've got you, Theo he said again presently, and she answered as before, Yes, Richard. He slipped from the couch to the floor at her feet. I'm tired out. My God, it's been a day. Awful. I don't know what I should do if you weren't here. 
After all, one's wife is one's wife, isn't she? She bowed her head in assent. He laid his head on her lap. The sigh he gave was like that of a tired child. There is something he hasn't told me. What is it? Mechanically, her hand dropped to his smooth, dark head, and she stroked it gently, as a mother might comfort a child. It's all right now you're here. You won't let me down. His breathing grew slow and even, and he slept. Her hand still smoothed his head. But her eyes looked steadily into the darkness in front of her, seeing nothing. Don't you think, Richard, that he'd better tell me everything? It was three days later, and they were in the drawing room before dinner. I don't know what you mean. Don't you? Well, of course there are details. I ought to know everything. Don't you think if I'm to help? What makes you think I want you to help? My dear Richard, I'm your wife. So you are, Theo. And a very good-looking wife, too. I never could stand ugly women. He began walking up and down the room, as was his custom when something was worrying him. I won't deny you're right, in a way. There is something. Yes? Oh, it's so damned hard to explain things of this kind to women. They'll get hold of the wrong end of a stick, and fancier things... Fancier thing is what it isn't. You see, the law is one thing, and right and wrong are another. I may do a thing that is perfectly right and honest, but the law wouldn't take the same view of it. Nine times out of ten, everything pans out all right. But the tenth time, you know, well, you can hit a snag. Why am I not surprised? Did I always know deep down that he wasn't straight? Richard went on talking. He explained himself at unnecessary lengths. Theodora was consent for him to cloak the actual details of the affairs in this mantle of verbosity, for the manner concerned a large tract of South African property— Exactly what Richard had done, she was not concerned to know. Morally, he assured her everything was fair and above board. Legally, well, there it was, no getting away from the fact. He had rendered himself liable to criminal prosecution. He kept shooting quick glances at his wife as he talked. He was nervous and uncomfortable. And still he excused himself and tried to explain away that which a child might have seen in its naked truth. Then, finally, in a burst of justification, he broke down. Perhaps Theo's eyes, momentarily scornful, had something to do with it. He sank down in a chair by the fireplace, his head in his hands. There it is, Theo. What are you going to do about it? She came over to him with scarcely a moment's pause, and, kneeling down by the chair, put her face against his. What can be done, Richard? What can we do? You mean you'll stick to me? My dear... Of course. I'm a thief, Theo. That's what it means, shorn of fine language. Just a thief. Then I'm a thief's wife, Richard. We'll sink or swim together. You know, Theo, I have got a plan. We'll talk of it later. It's just been a time now. We must go and change. Put on that creamy thing with Bob of yours. You know, the, 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 the Kailot model. For an evening at home? Yes, yes, I know, but I like it. Put it on, this good girl. It cheers me up to see you looking your best. Theo came down to dinner in the Kailot. It was a creation in cream brocade, with a faint pattern of gold running through it, and an undernote of pale pink to give warmth to a cream. It was cut daringly low in the back, and nothing could have been better to show off the dazzling whiteness of Theo's neck and shoulders. She was truly now a magnolia flower. Good girl. You know you look simply stunning in that dress. They went into dinner. Throughout the evening Richard was nervous and unlike himself, joking and laughing about nothing at all, as if in a vain attempt to shake off his cares. Several times Theo tried to lead him back to the subject they had been discussing before, but he edged away from it. Then suddenly, as she rose to go to bed, he came to the point. No, don't go yet. I've something to say. You know... About this miserable business. You know, with a bit of luck, this whole thing can be hushed up. Hmm? I mean, I've covered my tracks fairly well. It's it's just these papers, you see. There's, there's just these certain papers. That, as long as they don't get into the receiver's hands. Papers? 
You mean you'll destroy them? Well, look, I'd destroy them fast enough if I could get hold of them. That's the devil of it. Who has them, then? A man we both know. Vincent Eastman. A faint exclamation escaped Theo, but she forced it back. Yet Richard had noticed it. I've suspected he knew something of the business all along. That's why I've asked him here a good bit. You may remember I asked you to be nice to him. Yes, I remember. Somehow I never seem to have got on really friendly terms with him. I don't know why. But he likes you. I'd say he likes you a good deal. He does. Ah, well, that's good. Now you see what I'm driving at. I'm convinced that if you went to Vincent Easton and asked him to give you those papers, he wouldn't refuse. A mute, pretty woman, that sort of thing. I can't do that. Nonsense. It's out of the question. The red came slowly out in blotches on Richard's face. My dear girl, I don't think you quite realise the position. If this comes out, I'm liable to go to prison. It's ruin and disgrace. Vincent Easton will not use those papers against you, I'm sure of it. Well, that's not quite the point. He mightn't realise that they'll incriminate me. It's only taken in conjunction with my affairs. The figures they're bound to find. Now, I can't go into details, but he'll ruin me without knowing he's doing it unless somebody puts the position before him. You can do it yourself, surely. Write to him. A fat lot of good that would be. No, Theo, we have only got one hope. You are the trump card. You're my wife. You must help me. If you go to Easton tonight... Not tonight. Tomorrow, perhaps. Not tonight. My God, Theo, can't you realise things? Tomorrow may be too late. If you could go now at once to Easton's rooms... I know, my dear girl, I know it's a beastly thing to do. But it's life or death. Oh, Theo, you won't fail me. You said you'd do anything to help me. Not this. There are reasons. It's life or death, Theo. I mean it. See here. He snapped open a drawer of the desk and took out a revolver. If there was something theatrical about the action, it escaped her notice. It's that or shooting myself. I can't taste the racket. If you won't do as I ask you, I'll be a dead man before morning, and I swear to you solemnly, that's the truth. Oh, no, Richard, not that. Then help me. He flung the revolver down on the table and knelt by her side. Theo, my darling, if you love me, if you've ever loved me, you'll do this for me. You're my wife, Theo. I've no one else to turn to. On and on his voice went, murmuring, pleading. And at last Theo heard her own voice saying, Very well, yes. Richard took her to the door and put her into a taxi. Theo! Vincent Easton sprang up in incredulous delight. She stood in the doorway. Her wrap of white ermine was hanging from her shoulders. Never, Easton thought, had she looked so beautiful. You've come after all. No, Vincent, don't come any closer. It's not what you think. I'm here for my husband. He thinks you have some papers which may do him harm, and I've come to ask you to give them back. Give them to me. So that's it. I thought Hobson, Jekyll and Lucas sounded familiar the other day. I couldn't place them at the minute. I didn't know your husband was connected with the firm. Things have been going wrong there for some time. I was commissioned to look into the matter. I suspected some underling... Never thought of a man at the top. It makes no difference to you, this. But to put it plainly, that your husband is a swindler. She shook her head. It beats me. Will you wait for a minute or two? I'll get the papers. She sat down in a chair. He went into the other room. Presently he returned and delivered a small package into her hand. Thank you. Have you a match? Taking the matchbox he proffered, she knelt down by the fireplace. When the papers were reduced to a pile of ashes, she stood up. Thank you. Not at all. Please let me get you a taxi. He put her into it and saw her drive away. A strange, formal little interview. 
After the first, they had not even dared look at each other. Well, that was that, the end. He would go away abroad and try and forget. Theo leaned her head out of a window and spoke to the taxi driver. She could not go back at once to the house in Chelsea. She must have a breathing space. Seeing Vincent again had shaken her horribly. If only, if only, if only, if only. But she pulled herself up. Love for her husband, she had none. But she owed him loyalty. He was down, she must stick by him. Whatever else he might have done, he loved her. His offence had been committed against society, not against her. The taxi meandered on through the wide streets of Hampstead. They came out on the heath, and a breath of cool, invigorating air fanned Theo's cheeks. She had herself in hand again now. The taxi sped back towards Chelsea. Well, you've been a long time. Have I? Yes, a very long time. Is it... All right. He followed her, a cunning look in his eyes, but his hands were shaking. It's all right, is it? I burnt them myself. Oh. She went on into the study, sinking into a big armchair. Her face was dead white and her whole body drooped with fatigue. She thought to herself, If only I could go to sleep now and never, never wake up again. He was watching her, his glance shy, furtive, kept coming and going. She noticed nothing, and she was beyond noticing. It went off quite all right, then, eh? I've told you. You're sure they were the right papers? Did you look? No. But then I'm sure I tell you. Don't bother me, Richard. I can't bear any more tonight. No. No, uh, I see. He fidgeted about the room. Presently he came over to her, laid a hand on her shoulder, but she shook it off. Don't touch me. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. My nerves are on edge. I feel I can't bear to be touched. I, I know. I understand. Oh, Theo, I am so damned sorry. I oughtn't to have let you go there at this time of night. I, I know. Oh, I never dreamed you'd be subjected to any unpleasantness. Unpleasantness? <laughs> oh, you don't know, Richard. You don't know. I don't know what. What this night has cost me. My God. I never meant... You did that for me? Oh, the swine! See, I, I couldn't have known. I, I couldn't have guessed. Oh, my God! He was kneeling by her now, stammering, his arms round her, and she turned and looked at him with faint surprise, as though his words had at last penetrated to her attention. I never meant that. I never meant that. What, Richard? You never meant what? Well, tell me. What was it you never meant? Oh, don't let's speak of it. I don't want to know. I never want to think of it. She was staring at him, wide awake now, with every faculty alert. Her words came clear and distinct. You never meant what? What do you think happened? It didn't happen, Theo. Let's say it didn't happen. You think that I... I don't want... You think that Vincent Easton asked a price for those letters, and you think that I paid him. I, I never dreamed he was that kind of man. Didn't you? Why did you ask me to put that dress on this evening? Why did you send me there alone at this time of night? You guessed he cared for me, and you wanted to save your skin at any cost, even the cost of my honour. Oh, I see now. You meant this from the very beginning. Or at least you saw it as a possibility. And it didn't deter you. Theo, you can't deny it, Richard. I thought I knew all there was to know about you years ago. I've known almost from the first that you weren't straight as regards the world. But I thought you were straight with me. Look, Theo, can you deny what I'm saying? Listen, Richard, this is something I must tell you. 
Three days ago, when this blow fell on you, the servants told you I was away and gone to the country. That was only partly true. I had gone away with Vincent Easton. What? You? What? We were at Dover. I saw a paper. I realised what had happened. Then, as you know, I came back. Richard caught her by the wrist. His eyes burned into hers. You came back? In time? <laughs> yes, I came back in time, Richard. He relinquished his hold on her arm. He stood by the mantelpiece, his head thrown back. He looked handsome and rather noble. In that case, I can forgive. I cannot. You, what, what do you mean? I said I cannot forgive. In leaving you for another man, I sinned, not technically perhaps, but in intention, which is the same thing. But if I sinned, I sinned through love. You have not been faithful to me since our marriage. Oh, I know. That I forgave, because I really believed in your love for me. But the thing you have done tonight is different. It is an ugly thing, Richard, a thing no woman should forgive. You sold me, your own wife, to purchase safety. She picked up her wrap and turned towards the door. Theo, where are you going? We all have to pay in this life, Richard. For my sin, I must pay in loneliness. For yours? Well, you gambled with the thing you love, and you have lost it. You're going? To freedom. There is nothing to bind me here. He heard the door shut. Ages passed. Or was it a few minutes? Something fluttered down outside the window. The last of the magnolia petals. Soft. Fragrant.